And we're back. It's taken me a full week to stop crying after last week's episode, so it's kind of nice that this episode doesn't have any soul-destroying gut punches lined up for us this week. As always, no spoilers beyond episode four, so let's jump in. We open with Ellie being weird again and giving the gun a little sniff test just to check that it works properly. Why does Joel allow this lunatic to be unsupervised so often? No wondering. Oh, wait, what? Okay, the pun bit was good, and I like how this links back later in the episode, showing us that Joel is an actual person somewhere deep down in there. I also like the close attention to detail when explaining that gas doesn't work the same way anymore because it's watered down over time. Oh fuck yeah, they include the porn magazine scene. I am so happy. I am a fan and I have been serviced. Well done. Now it's time for the, the song fact round. The song playing in this scene is called Alone and Forsaken by Hank Williams and it basically takes us through Joel's journey from a loving father to a shell of the person that we see today. The lyrics start in the spring when everything's happy and lovely and then the song tells us about a love that is withered and gone, meaning Sarah. The Horace goes alone and forsaken by fate and by man, which is pretty self-explanatory. We're about to see how forsaken that man has become in this episode. I think this will be something that I say every breakdown at this point, but oh my God, the scenery is just so good. Who's in charge of this? Wait, what? Christ, that's a lot of people. Give them all a raise immediately. I love the extent they highlight how amazing nature and wildlife are doing without humanity hindering it. God, we're a fucking scourge, you guys. The forest camping scene is our first real look at bonding between our unlikely pair, and it's cute and not too on the nose, which is good. We see our first hint that Joel's a bit deaf, or maybe he was just ignoring the little psycho, because I personally would. And we also get a small bit of backstory for Joel and Tommy, and it gives us a bit more information about Tess too. Describing her as family definitely shines more light on how Joel felt about her and even if that is different from how she felt about Joel. I like that we're not automatically forgetting that these characters exist the second that they die. Joel is a fucking badass. That's all I have to say about this entire scene. Not really, but it's the main takeaway. The second that he sees Fedra is gone, Joel instantly clocks the worst and he's more correct than I was when I decided drinking three bottles of wine in one sitting was not a good idea. Volcott got KO'd by Ellie and it turns out that he was just a stupid kid. Oh my God, I love Pedro Pascal. He just chews the scenery with his eyes. I love it. I love him. I love his eyes. While I do like that Ellie is knocked from her psychopathic pedestal and reacts in a normal way to, you know, like shooting a kid in the back, I dislike that there is no real consequences for her taking the gun in the first place. In the game, I felt like there was a moment of trust between Joel and Ellie when she got the gun. There's no reason why it couldn't play out similarly here. Ellie could have easily stabbed Brian McBall cut and then Joel could have given her a gun as a reward or something. Like, I don't know. It just seems strange that she has a knife but doesn't stab him and that she does something incredible incredibly stupid by stealing this gun and nothing really comes of it. This is a strong start for Kathleen as an evil Disney queen. Someone give her a cool hat immediately. I'd only ever seen Melanie Linsky in Two and a Half Men before this, so I rate her performance highly already because she's not acting really stupid. The doctor is super sure that he's going to live because he's a doctor, but he hasn't played The Last of Us yet, so he doesn't realise that nothing ever has a happy ending. Doctors in this post-apocalyptic shit show are obviously incredibly important because it's not like we have prestigious Harvard med school to train up more when some die. This cements Kathleen as being a big tyrant because she does not give a goose. Oh, it took me 40 minutes to realise that there were no zombies in this episode. That's good. It means that the story works on its own merit and doesn't need action-packed jump scares a minute to make it work. Oh, look, there's another little Game of Thrones reference for you there. Oh, God, they fucked that up so badly. Joel and Ellie share their first real moment where they're both open with each other and it's good shit. Lines like, we'll get through this, are generic, but it makes sense because Joel's pretty rusty at this type of thing. He does want to protect her, not just physically, but emotionally too. Why the fuck is the floor moving? Oh, ho, ho, ho. this brings a whole new element of terrifying to this entire ordeal because I'm willing to bet a limb it's nothing as innocent as subsidence going on there. Oh, they're just going to close the door and ignore that one. I'm sure that's absolutely, definitely not going to come back to haunt them. I sort of love that nobody's the baddie yet. I don't think the infected really count as they're more of a plot device. Kathleen is the closest thing we've seen so far to a baddie. And even then, her and her people come across as sympathetic to an extent. When Joel doesn't answer the question about killing innocent people, is it because he doesn't know? I think it's pretty apparent to everyone that humanity isn't black or white anymore. There's no good guys, but there's no bad guys either. Even Brian McBallcut, who at first seems like he absolutely should die, screams from the high heavens the second that he gets shot that he's actually not bad and that he's just a normal kid with a name and a mom. Kathleen is framed, in my opinion, as quite soft in her opening scene with the Doctor. I got 
got a shock when she actually decided to unalive the dude. This woman means business. I like that she's got beef with Henry because of what looks like the death of her brother. This is a welcome addition from the games. It seems like she'll do anything to get revenge for her brother's death, including convincing people that it's Henry's fault that McBallcut died and killing the only person that can help the sick. She was trying to protect her brother, but Henry's just trying to protect his brother. The things we do for love. This is certainly a heavy theme that we've already seen and we'll definitely be seeing more of. There's so much mirroring from the game in this episode. Most of the pun jokes come straight from the game and I've already mentioned, but the nudie mag scene is basically verbatim from the game. Again, there's too many to put in one video. However, I love that they've actually included the game elements in the game, such as pushing Ellie through small spaces to get her to open things for Joel and shoving large objects against the door so that other things can't get through. The final scene's really sweet until it isn't. The dynamic between Ellie and Joel shifts tectonically here and for the first time since Sarah lived, we see him smile. It's a cute little moment. Remember, these moments are very infrequent, so take them and cradle them in your arms while you can. We're interrupted by two people who don't seem that friendly and one of them is a child. We can assume that this is Henry and Sam. Sam has superhero paint on his face, showing us, along with the pictures on the wall from earlier, that he loves his superheroes, but most importantly reminding us that he is a child and his innocence has been taken away from him much too early. Like every child living in this lovely timeline. What a good way to end that episode. God, it's good shit. Who gets straight to my veins? Subscribe for more of this next week and see the playlist that's linked here or in the description for what you've missed so far. I stream on Twitch on Wednesdays and Thursdays, so come stop by and say hi. As always, press all the buttons, do all the things, and I'll catch you next time. Toodaloo!